Hey, welcome students. All right, this is Management of Patients with Dermatologic Disorders. All right, here we go. Objectives of therapy are to prevent additional damage, prevent secondary infection, reverse inflammatory response, and relieve symptoms. Nursing management includes obtaining a full health history, direct observation, a, f a complete full head-to-toe physical assessment of every single uh, body system, all eight, and educating the patient on self-care. Nursing care includes administration of topical as well as systemic PO medications, wound care, wound dressings, and providing patient hygiene. Puritis simply means itching. It can be associated with a number of disorders, including dry skin, skin disease, pregnancy, and rarely cancer. Anyone can get puritis, but certain groups of people are more susceptible to this condition. It includes people who have seasonal allergies, hay fever, asthma, eczema, diabetes mellitus, HIV AIDS, various types of cancers, especially like lupus. Uh, leukemia or lymphomas. Um, additionally, let's see, pregnant women, the elderly, patients who are taking um, antibiotics, hormone therapy, some opioid patients get itching, um, certain soaps, chemical exposures, radiation therapy. We get it here in Arizona due to prickly, pe uh, prickly heat response, right? All kinds of stuff. Even psychological stress can bring on puritis, okay? If a drug reaction is suspected, switching to a different medication may be helpful to reduce the itching. However, most drug reactions have a rash along with itching, so that's typically going to be there too if it's med-related. The best way to prevent puritis is to take care of the skin. To protect skin, we're going to use skin creams and lotions that moisturize the skin and prevent dryness. We're gonna use sunscreens regularly to prevent sunburns and skin damage. We're gonna use mild soap that doesn't really have perfumes in it that can irritate the skin. Uh, take a bath or a shower in warm, not hot water. Avoid certain fabrics such as wool or synthetics that can make the skin itch. Switch to cotton clothing and cotton bed sheets. Um, since warm, dry air can make skin dry, keep the thermostat in your home down and use a humidifier. This is things we're going to tell our patient. To relieve itching, we'll tell them to place a cool washcloth or some ice over the area that itches rather than scratching. We don't want them scratching or rubbing or any of that, okay? It's just going to cause the inflammatory response to kick in even more and the itching to just, you know, ramp up and get worse. We're going to reinforce prescribed therapeutic regimen. We're going to educate on self-care. We're going to educate on using tepid water for bath. That's very, uh, again, warm, but not hot. We're going to avoid rubbing vigorously with the towel, right? So we're going to pat dry, basically. We're going to lubricate the skin after bathing. We're going to avoid situations that cause vaso dilation, like overly warm environments, ingesting alcohol, eating really hot foods, or drinking really hot liquids, those kinds of things, right? Um, some infectious diseases of the skin include bacterial, bacterial infections like cellulitis, viral infections like herpes zoster or herpes simplex virus, right? Um, and it could be herpes simplex, remember, could be one or two. It could be in the mouth, the oral, uh, or it could be in the um, genitalia or labial area, oral labial area. Um, could be fungal infections like tinea, uh, tinea, uh, tinea pedius or tinea pedius. That's how we say it in, in uh, Texas. Tinea pedius, tinea corpus, corporis. Tinea capitis, Tinea cru cruris, and Tinea ungium. Um, so I would have a general understanding of these skin disorders, right? And how we would treat them, how we're going to educate our patients, those kinds of things. Patient education regarding antibiotics, hygiene, and skin care, uh, and lesion care are really important, okay? Don't share towels, don't share combs, all of the... ADL stuff. Um, they're going to bathe daily with an antibacterial soap. Um, we're going to tell them that uh, boils and pimples and frinicles, all of those things should never ever be squeezed. So don't touch them, right? Just adding more bacteria in them and dirt and all kinds of crap. 
um, viral infections. Okay, so again, herpes zoster, the treatment of herpes zoster has three major objectives. We're gonna treat the acute viral infection. Second, we're gonna treat the acute pain because it's very painful. And third, we're going to prevent any type of uh, post-therapeutic neuralgia, okay? So we're gonna use antiviral agents. We're also gonna probably use oral corticosteroids. Um, and adjunctive therapy, and it will be individualized, right, for the patient, the adjunctive therapy. Uh, pain management definitely is going to be a piece of it. Um, again, the objectives are going to be like, you know, in instruct the patient about their antiviral meds, how to take them appropriately, instruct the patient how to care for the lesions, right? How to do their dressings, how to clean their hands. They got to have meticulous hand hygiene because, you know, um, we need to make sure that no extra bacteria or foreign material is introduced into, you know, these uh, lesions. Um, therapy may include non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, right, NSAIDs. We will do, for the lesions, we're going to do wet dressings with 5% aluminum acetate. Uh, we're going to apply that to the uh, lesions for 30 to 60 minutes and they're gonna have to do this like four to six times a day okay and we're gonna have and give them calamine lotions also to help with reducing that itch response in the body right um, the risk of spreading the virus that causes shingles is low if the rash is covered people with shingles should keep the rash covered not touch it or scratch the rash and then wash their hands frequently so that they don't spread the shingles virus. It's highly, highly contagious if someone touches those those sores, right? And they're not uh, crusted over, right? It can You can really spread it fast. Uh, but once the rash has actually developed those crusts, that person is no longer contagious. That's how we know, right? Uh, herpes simplex virus. Again, there are two types. I said on the previous screen, we have the herpes simplex virus one tends to affect the patient's mouth and face. And then we have herpes simplex virus two, which tends to affect the patient's genital area. Herpes simplex virus one spreads through contact with the virus in our saliva or our skin. Again, it usually affects the patient's mouth and face. Herpes simplex virus two spreads through sexual contact um, and usually affects the patient's genitals. Now, it's important to note that you can get herpes simplex virus two, you know, by, um, it doesn't need to be, you know, physical sex. It could be, you know, oral sex. Uh, if there's, if somebody has herpes simplex virus one on their mouth and they have oral sex with another person, they could actually end up giving them the herpes simplex virus two. It could uh, mutate to that area. Okay. So just be very careful. We got to educate our patients all about that. Okay. Um, let's see, either form of herpes simplex virus can show up on any area of the skin that comes into contact with the virus. Once a person contacts herpes, it is a lifelong condition. Symptoms usually include sores that last up to 10 days, right? Um, and once they have the virus, they will have it, right? Um, and it'll be, they'll have periods of exacerbation where they have the source for 10 days and then they'll have periods where their condition is managed right um because there are some people who have absolutely no signs and symptoms of the herpes right on the outside um so again and then there's others that have few to no herpes outbreaks um and thus choose not to be treated because they never have to deal with the exacerbations of the condition right but many people prefer to use medications that shorten the outbreaks and reduce the symptoms during those outbreaks. So during an outbreak, the patient may use an antiviral ointment or cream to help lessen the symptoms and help them uh, go away faster. But it only works if the patient starts taking the medication right after the outbreak, right? Immediately when the outbreak happens. Um, Many people with herpes simplex 2 take daily oral medications to keep those out outbreaks at bay, right, to keep them away. 
Instructions regarding prescription antiviral medications and prophylactic medication use. We're going to give them instructions regarding how to prevent the spread of herpes, all the ways, right? We're going to give them uh, measures to reduce can, um, like neonates, mothers with genital herpes. We're going to do lots of education there, and we're going to educate them about how, um, you know, we'll Many times those patients will opt to have a C-section, right? So that, especially if they're, they're in an active infection and they have sores, because they don't want to pass the virus onto, their, onto the babies, right? Okay. What are fungal infections? Fungal infections or mycosis are diseases caused by a fungus, yeast or mold, right? Fungal infections are most common on your skin or nails, but fungi, plural for fungus, can also cause infections in your mouth, throat, lungs, urinary tract, so many body organs, right? Instructions regarding medications, use of oral and topical agents and shampoos are going to be given from nurses to uh, patients, right? Um, instructions regarding hygiene, uh, including using clean towels, using clean washcloths every single time they clean themselves, it needs to be a clean towel and washcloth. They're not going to share towels, clearly. They're not going to share combs and so on, right? Nothing ADLs. They're going to have their own. They're going to keep their skin folds clean and dry. They're going to keep their feet clean and dry. They're going to wear clean, dry cotton clothing, including underwear and socks. And we're really going to educate them to avoid any kind of synthetic underwear, any kind of tight-fitting garments, avoid wet bathing suits avoid those plastic shoes all of those things right are not good and we're going to avoid excessive heat um, and humidity and hair loss associated with tinea capitis is temporary so fyi typically pediculosis is an infection with the head uh, the human head and body louse the pediculu uh, pediculus i never get this word right you don't need to know it. It's just, you need to know pediculosis is the infestation of head lice, okay? There are two subtypes. Um, there is the head louse, right? The capitis, and then the body louse, uh, the body lice, which is huma humanus. They are, uh, they have to live off of human's blood, okay? So that's what they do. It's a parasite. Um, there are some, countries that have endemics, right, um, in underdeveloped countries, even in some developing countries too. Um, itching of the scalp is common and often the sole symptom of pediculosis capitis, right? So when somebody has head lice, that's typically what we see. They scratch their head because of the head lice biting the scalp, right? Um, and the pediculus, pediculosis corp corporis is the skin condition caused by the body lice that feed again on human blood. And these lice will lay their eggs in the seams of clothing and bedding while moving to human skin to feed. Um, and then we have the pu pubis, the pubic lice, commonly called crabs, are tiny insects found in the patient's genital area. Scabies or mites are an infestation of the skin um, by the human itch mite, sarco, uh, it's scabie basically, right? And the, mic the microscopic scabies, they, they burrow into the upper layer of the skin where it uh, lives and it lays its eggs. And again, the most common symptom of scabies are itching skin and a pimple-like skin rash. Head lice may infest anyone and are not a sign of uncleanliness. Instruction for use of shampoo um, includes the lindane or the uh, pyrethrin. I am slaughtering that word, P-Y-R-E-T-H-R-I-N. And what we do is we put that shampoo in there and then we comb the hair with this really fine tooth comb that we dip in vinegar and we uh, then work with that comb and remove the nits which is the eggs of uh, those um, var things. Um, let's see, lindane, remember, it's important to note that lindane 
have may have toxic effects and must be used only as directed okay never ever and we have to tell our patients this like they can't overuse that that shampoo because it can actually cause um toxicity in their body okay all article of clothing and bedding must be disinfected washed in extremely hot water or dry cleaned right so it's got to get to a temperature where they actually kill off the um, mites and eggs right furniture and flowers should be frequently vacuumed again we are not going to share anything that we um, use for our ADLs or clothing or hats or hair bands or any of that stuff okay and all family members and close contacts must be treated with medicated shampoo if there's a person in the home who has a lice again I'm going to say that again all members of the family or close contacts friends families right anybody who hangs out with the person that has um, head lice will need to be treated with the medicated, py what is that, pyrethrin or lindane shampoo. Pediculosis corp corporis is a disease related to poor hygiene. So this one, unlike, unlike head lice, head lice is not related to poor hygiene. However, pediculosis corporis is related to poor hygiene. Um, or those who live in close quarters with, with individuals who have poor hygiene, right? So we have pediculosis pubis is common and spread chiefly by sexual contact. Um, we want to bathe in soap and water. This is what we're going to tell our patient, tell our patients, bathe in soap and water and apply prescription scabicide or over-the-counter uh, permethrin. If eyelashes are involved, Vaseline may be applied twice a day for up to eight days. And then we want to mechanically remove any nits that we see. All families, uh, all family members and sexual partners must be treated and instructed regarding personal hygiene. All clothing and bedding must be washed uh, with extremely hot water or dry cleaned again with the temperature that is needed to kill off Patients and partners should also be scheduled for checkups to assess uh, for any kind of coexisting sexually transmitted diseases. All right, scabies. Um, is an itchy skin rash caused by tiny burrowing mites called sarcope, uh, uh, scabies, basically. Intense itching, sorry, I'm starting to scratch. Intense itching occurs in the area where the mites actually burrow under the skin. They need to scratch. Um, the need to scratch the skin may be stronger at night when they tend to be more active. Scabies is contagious and can spread very quickly uh, through close person-to-person -person contact, right? So skin-to-skin -skin touching. And a patient can actually transfer it from their own skin to another part of their skin. So for example, if they had scabies on the bottom of, you know, on the top of their lower left leg and they cross their legs when they sit in a recliner, then they could transfer it from the top of their left leg to the bottom of their right leg, right? So it's important we educate them on that. Um, let's see here. Again, scabies is contagious and can be spread very quickly through close to close contact, like shaking hands. Uh, mites frequently involve fingers and hands and hand contact uh, can, you know, you can spread it from hand to hand, sorry. Coffee hasn't kicked in yet. <laughs> Healthcare personnel should wear gloves when providing care, obviously, until infection is ruled out. Instruct patients to take a warm, soapy bath. Allow skin to cool. And then they need to apply the scabicide, lindane, uh, per, uh, permethrin, or whatever solution they get, you know, uh, prescription to the entire body. Not including the face or scalp. They need to leave it on for 12 to 24 hours. Again, wash clothing and bedding in hot water and dry in a, uh, dry the clothes in a hot dryer temp. Treat all contacts at the same time. So everybody gets treated at the same time and you treat all of the different clothing and bedding at the same time. And then, they, and then we need to educate them to repeat this treatment in one week to prevent reinfestation, right? Puritis may continue for several weeks and doesn't mean necessarily that treatment is required okay so let me rephrase let me restate that so itching or puritis may continue 
after you they do this second treatment for several weeks, right? It doesn't mean that they still have have the scabies in there, right? Psoriasis is a chronic autoimmune inflammatory disease of the skin in which the epidermal cells are produced at an abnormally rapid rate. Psoriasis is a skin disease that causes a rash with itching, scaly patches, most commonly on the knees and the elbows, maybe the trunk and the scalp. Psoriasis is a common long-term, meaning it's a chronic disease and it has no cure. It can be very painful, it can interfere with sleep, and it can make it very hard for patients to concentrate. It affects, you know, every race. Um, only about 3% of Americans though, and it's predominantly in Caucasians, and the median age is about 28 is when patients start to see it. And remember, this is, it's an autoimmune disease. So there are periods of remission, right, where they are managed and, and have no, you know, scaly skin and they're not dealing with that. And then they're, they have exacerbation periods throughout their life that can get really uh, intense at times, right? Um, things that may aggravate and bring on exacerbations include stress, for sure, right? Trauma. It could be a seasonal thing, right? Maybe the heat for some people brings on um, a, a reaction in the body. It could be hormones, right? There's so many things that could bring on a reaction and exacerbate the condition. How we treat it is we we give uh, we instruct the patients to take baths to help remove the scales. Uh, we give oral medications like immunosuppressants and steroids and anti-inflammatory medications. We do light therapy, uh, stress management. Uh, there are topical ointments that can help. Medical management of psoriasis. Okay, so the goal obviously is to slow the rapid turnover of the epidermis, right? We want to promote resolution of the psoriatic lesions that are there. And we need to control the disease cycle, right? And try to prevent as many exacerbations as we can. We want to remove the scales during the bath using a very soft brush. We are going to apply emollient creams after. And we're going to maintain a routine, right? So that the patient can be as healthy as they can. Again, pharmacological therapy, topical, phototherapy, systemic PO therapy, right? All of that. Okay, so patient education for psoriasis patients. Um, so it's going to include the disease itself, right? The skin care and the treatment regimen. Measurements to prevent skin injury are going to be educated, like avoid picking or scratching at the psoriatic uh, plaques, you know, the skin. We're going to educate on patients preventing their skin getting dry because this makes it worse, right? So measures to prevent skin dryness, so like use of emollients, right? Um, avoid a sex, a excessive washing of the skin because that always dries it out. Uh, use lukewarm water, not hot water. Uh, we're going to educate them to pat their skin dry because rubbing, even like after a shower or bath, right? Rubbing is, it tears down the skin, right? Dries it out. And then we're going to use um, use of therapeutic relationship to support and aid them in their coping. Because remember, this is life altering. This condition, can, when there's an exacerbation, it really is all consuming at times. All right, pressure injuries now. So pathophysiology of pressure injuries. So pressure injuries are defined as localized damage to the skin, as well as underlying soft tissue damage, usually occurring over a, bon a bony prominence um, or related to maybe medical devices too, right? They are the result of prolonged or severe pressure with contributions from shearing force and friction force, right? Localized areas of necrotic soft tissue It'll occur when pressure is applied to the skin that is greater than the normal capillary closure pressure. When this happens, then we have an injury. Over a period of time, sufficient enough, you know, there's repeated over a period of time and then after a while, it's, it's enough to cause that skin breakdown.
So here are the areas where you would be, patients would be susceptible to pressure injuries, okay? The back of the head or the occipital of the head, right? The ears, obviously. When they, it's not the front of the patient on this picture, but when patients wear oxygen, remember the cheeks um, and the nose. We want to look at those skins. The scapula, right? When we sit back, that's what hits the back of the chair. Our elbows, clearly. Our sacrum. Our... Um, the knees, the heels, um, all of those things, right? The hips, same. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the different types of mechanical forces that contribute to pressure injuries with our patients. So, friction injury affects the epidermis or top layer of the skin. The outermost, uh, the outermost surface skin is removed by dragging the body part across something like bed sheets or wheelchair cushions, um, or sliding boards, or because of spasticity cause, causing a body part to rub against something, right? Sometimes a patient can do it to themselves because they're having, you know, spasticities. Um, friction injury will look red, purple, or irritated, or like a blister with the top layer of the skin removed. If the top layer of the skin is removed, an opening in the protective barrier can allow bacteria or viruses or other foreign invaders to enter the body, right? Because we know our skin is our number one um, protector of foreign invaders. So that is friction. In shearing, there is pressure as well as friction. Both are present in this injury. The pressure comes, from, um, comes typically from a bony prominent, prominence applying pressure to the inside of the skin from the weight of the body. At the same time, a friction injury is occurring where the two top layers of the skin separate. Okay, so that's the difference. Friction, two top layers of the skin separate. The dermis of the lower layer of the skin feeds the epidermis or top layer. When these two layers are separated, the top layer cannot get the nutrients needed to support it. Dragging skin across surfaces can cause this separation of layers. Shearing appears as discoloration of the skin, much like a friction injury or pressure injury, but it is much deeper in the tissue, right? The body responds in the same way as with the friction injury with pain, spasticity increases, um, and then you get all, you know, what it looks like described above. So we do not want to cause friction or shearing uh, injuries. So let's be very, very careful when we're moving our patients, moving them up in bed, moving, you know, moving them from one, like from bed to a wheelchair, all of that, okay? So let's be very, very careful. Assessment of risk factors for pressure injuries. So we're definitely gonna evaluate the level of mobility with our patients, right? And so we know exactly how much like, do we need two people to help move the patient, right? Is it a two-person lift assist? These are extremely important so that we don't cause those injuries to the patient, right? Separating those tissues. We're definitely going to assess the neurovascular status. Same thing. If the patient's confused, it's not a good time to move them by yourself. Never, ever, right? You want to get somebody to help you. We're going to evaluate the circulatory status because we know that if circulation is compromised, so too is the skin, right? Because the blood feeds the skin. So we're going to also evaluate the nutritional status and their hydration status because we know patients who are dehydrated or who don't consume enough protein and or micronutrients to restore the skin, right? That's a problem. We're going to review the results of the patient's laboratory studies because that's going to, again, tell us how healthy the patient is, right? We're going to look at the um, albumin levels and the CBC and all of those levels, right? All their electrolytes to see if, in fact, they have the nutri nutrition on board to have good, healthy um, skin healing. Uh, what else are we going to do? We're going to determine if they're incontinent. Do they even ever have any incontinence? That's a problem because the skin has to remain clean and dry, right? And then, of course, we're going to look at the current medica medications because there are some medications that can cause um, issues where 
skin breakdown, you know, can happen, right? I can, there's so many, but let me just give you one. For example, if a patient has um, a UTI and they're taking a strong antibiotic, we know that antibiotics cause GI distress, right? We know it causes GI distress. So as a result, many of our patients are gonna have uh, diarrhea, right? And so we need to educate them to make sure that they clean very thoroughly after each bowel movement during the the treatment with those antibiotics. Okay, assessment of the skin for the patient with pressure injuries. So we're gonna assess all of the skin, head to toe, every crack and crevice, at least twice a day when somebody has skin breakdown. Um, we're going to look at the wound, pressure injury twice a day as well, probably even more, but a minimum of twice a day. We're gonna expect each pressure site for erythema we're gonna assess for blanching response, right? So when you got that erythema, you're gonna press your finger on it, let go, and it should blanch, meaning the blood should run out of it and run back in it. And when it doesn't, that's problematic. We're gonna palpate the skin for increased warmth. We're gonna inspect for dry skin. We're gonna look look to see, is it dry skin? Is it moist skin? Are there any breaks in the skin? Are there any drainage? Is there an odor? There's like all of the things that we do with our assessments, right? Okay, so nursing interventions for patients with pressure injuries. Obviously, we need to reduce the risk of pressure injuries. The way that we do that is we reduce and relieve pressure. Clearly, we are gonna reposition our patients every two hours, at least every two hours, I should say. Some people do it more frequently. We are going to position the patient with pillows and pressure relieving devices like heel troughs and mattresses and splints and pillows. Um, uh, whatever we got to do, honestly, to relieve that pressure, right? Um, we are going to increase mobility with our patients because we know that the reason many times that there's pressure injuries is because of immobility, right? So we're gonna get our patients up and moving, and I mean like every hour, right? Um, and it's good for blood flow anyway, and to prevent any kind of deep vein thrombosis that could literally turn into a pulmonary embolism, right? So we gotta get on that and get, and get them up and moving. We are going to assess the patient's sensory perception because anytime there's a development of a new sensory perception uh, problem, then we know that's a increased risk for pressure injuries, right? So we're definitely going to be reassessing for that all the time. We're going to be reassessing for tissue perfu perfusion, right? Also, many times nutritional status is a problem when they come to us, right? So now we're going to look to see are our, our interventions of having the patient consume protein first and then vitamin second, right? As far as their meals, has that helped? Has that improved their skin, right? Healing. We're gonna eliminate any risk for friction or shear. And we're gonna minimize any type of moisture to the skin, right? Because we always want the skin when it's intact to be clean and dry, right? So for stage one ulcers, we're definitely gonna keep the skin clean and dry. So again, we're gonna remove all pressures from the area of a stage one. We're gonna keep the area clean and dry as possible to prevent bacterial infections. We're gonna speed up the healing process by having our patients consume adequate calories, first of all. They're gonna have a diet high in protein. That's the first item we're gonna encourage them to eat. And then of course, the second item will be high in minerals and vitamins, right? <clears throat> so again, that's treatment for a stage one. Um, stage two, we are going to clean the area again, really, really well, right? We are going, so sterile normal saline, sorry, sterile normal saline. So, um, we are going to clean that wound really well. Um, and we're going to, um, make sure that we're relieving pressure on that area as well. Um, and if there is any like loot or dead, loose or dead tissue, we're gonna, you know, again, we're gonna clean it really well with normal saline to ensure that we get rid of that dead tissue, right? Um, to ensure that it's able to start to heal that damaged skin. Again, I think it's critically important that we educate our patients not 
to use hydrogen peroxide. For some reason, people love hydrogen peroxide. However, hydrogen peroxide, um, if is when it's used, it can actually kill off newly developed cells, uh, healthy wound tissue that has <clears throat> that has been created by the body, right? through the nutrition and things that we're giving our patients. So we have to really educate our patients to stay away from hydrogen peroxide for the most part um, when it comes to <clears throat> wounds. So um, we usually use a transparent film dressing on our stage two, and that's just primarily used to protect the skin that remains intact. Um, it provides a barrier to like urine and stool, other body fluids, sweat, all of that, so the skin doesn't get macerated, right? Um, and it's transparent, so this allows for the nurse to be able to observe the wound, right? And uh, it can be put on, a transparent film dressing, by the way, can be put on and left in place for a couple days. So, um, so again, um, have a see-through dressing to keep out bacteria and any kind of foreign invaders and to make sure that we can look at the wound bed to see if there's any indication of infections like redness, you know, pus, fever, irritation, all those kinds of things, right? Um, in a stage two, if the patient is healthy enough, um, they usually recover from their wounds with this type of treatment in three days to up to three weeks, right? But again, that's with patients who have good perfusion, not chronic illness, um, that could delay healing, right? Okay, what else do I want to say about stage two? I think that's it. So our goal obviously is not to allow it to advance to a stage three. <clears throat> okay, so for stage three, <clears throat> excuse me, for stage three, uh, these are wounds that are characterized by extensive tissue damage. Sometimes there will be tunneling that is involved um, or undermining as well. And um, you're going to, first thing we're going to do is we're literally going to get, if you have a wound nurse, which almost every facility does, if not all, you're going to get them involved because you want the expert, you know, they've gone through a lot of extra training to be a wound nurse in most places, right? And you want their education to help you with the best possible treatment for this for this particular patient and this particular stage three wound, right? So you're gonna get them involved <clears throat> in the beginning to give you um, ideas on exactly how they want us to treat the wound, right? And then of course they do follow up with the physician who's following that patient on you know exactly how to uh, treat that stage three remember though stage three is a full thickness skin loss um, where adipose or fat tissue is visible in the ulcer and granulation tissue and the epoboli rolled wound edges are often present okay so we're going to be looking particularly at um again cleansing the stage three wound very well um, with sterile normal saline we are going to uh, many times doctors will order uh, debridement to remove the eschar and sloth tissue from the wound bed um, so we're going to start with that right take off the old dressing and we're going to give it a good wash with the sterile normal saline. Then we're going to use the debridement um, medication to help remove any eschar and sloth from this from the wound. Uh, once the bed sore is free of that eschar and sloth, we're going to use again the normal saline to cleanse it up really, really well. Um, and then we will. Um, treat it with uh, bandaging, right? Uh, gauze, foam, other bandages to protect protect that, that wound bed, right? Um, sometimes, you know, there'll be additional products 
uh, that the doctor will order based on what's how the wound is healing, right? If they want to use a Vaseline gauze or some kind of other product to leave on in the wound bed itself, right? And of course, we have already talked about this in detail. We are always, always going to do a, a wet to or moist to dry. It needs to be moist on the, the wound bed, right? And then we put a dry dressing over the top of the wound and then cover it up. But the, the bed of the wound itself needs to stay moist because that's what uh, evidence base has shown us. That's what encourages healing or new tissue uh, regeneration, right? And then the outside though of the bed, of the wound bed needs to be dry or it gets macerated and that skin breaks down, okay? Okay, what else do I want to tell you? Remember, stage three is again, full thickness skin loss with subcutaneous fat exposed. However, it is not muscles, bones, or tendons exposed, right? That's stage four. That's when you advance from stage three to stage four is when now instead of only seeing only seeing sub-Q fat, which is stage three, now we're seeing muscles, bones, and tendons. That's stage four, okay? So now you know the, the difference between the, the two stages. Um, and then we can treat them accordingly, right? Okay, so that's stage three. Next, we're gonna talk about stage four and what nurses can do, honestly, to help with our patient stage four. Treatment for stage four includes uh, keeping the area clean, uh, definitely applying pressure relieving devices, uh, definitely preventing you know, the wound from s becoming systemic, so that could kill the patient, right? Sometimes surgery may be necessary to remove or debride part of the tissue, absolutely. Um, we are most likely going to be giving the patient antibiotics to destroy any bacteria that is growing in the wound. Um, we ourselves are going to be doing debridement and removing damaged, infected, or dead tissue from the wound. Uh, we may have skin grafts, right, because the areas are, are so large that there's not enough healthy tissue to close it up or for it to grow from the inside out, right? So we may need to cover the affected area with healthy skin. That's a skin graft, right? So we know that um, the goal for treatment of a stage four wound is to properly debride the wound. Um, we need to dress the wound cavity appropriately, and that we talked about in the other recordings where we're going to pack the wound lightly. Um, so that the wound grow, uh, heals from the inside out, right? We are going to create and maintain a moisture wound bed environment for optimal healing. And then we're going to cover it with a dry dressing on the outside to protect the wound from infection, from trauma, that kind of thing, right? Um, and then, of course, the goal of properly unloading pressure from the area still always applies. We always, always want to provide pressure release, pressure relief, right? All right, um, let's see. And then for unstageable wounds, right? Those are the ones where they're covered by eschar or covered by sloth, and we can't see exactly is bone, tendons, ligaments, and those kinds of things exposed, so we know we have a stage four, or is it just subcutaneous tissue, so we know it's stage three. We can't tell, so we can't stage it. Never, ever stage an unstageable wound, okay? And, by the way, we never, ever restage a wound. A stage four wound will be a stage four wound the entire time until it's completely healed and then the wound is healed. We never say, okay, the stage four is now a stage three. We don't do that, okay? Um, so, again, unstageable means sloth or scar is present. You cannot see the depth of the wound and the underlying tissue, and therefore we treat it as such, right? Um, other treatment methods include uh, debridement, which we talked about, wet to dry dressings we talked about. Um, sometimes we do have necrotic and infected exudate that we need to mechanically flush out. So we will literally, using a syringe, um, will 
fill up with whatever solution the doctor has ordered to mechanically flush out that dead, infected necrotic tissue. Then we may also apply what's called an enzymatic or enzyme preparation that will help dissolve that necrotic tissue or slough, right? Or we may even um, send them in to surgery to have the doctor um, dissect that eschar tissue and cut it off, right? After the pressure ulcer is clean, we're gonna apply a topical treatment. Um, that's going to promote granulation. Again, the doctor will decide what that is with the wound nurse, of course. And then we're gonna apply sometimes negative pressure wound therapy, which is the wound vax, um, which help pull out excess fluid and air and assist with like a hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, well, not hyperbaric, but it provides that positive environment where not only is it pulling off fluid and air that's, um, but it's providing that wonderful environment for good tissue to grow in. Or if a patient is really bad, they may get hyperbaric oxygen treatment. I almost jumped there too quickly. <laughs> but if it's a severely compromised wound and the patient has like severe comorbidities, they may actually need an order to go into a hyperbaric oxygen chamber where the wound can be treated, uh, prof you know, thoroughly with this wonderful um, hyper oxygen environment. And it's so good to see the wounds there. It's amazing to see when a patient truly doesn't have perfusion, you know, to the lower limbs and like diabetics and they get those intense wounds. It's amazing to see how hyperbaric oxygen treatment can help um, start to regenerate new tissue. And just as a side note, that, that treatment is expensive and it's difficult to get approved, but as the patient's uh, advocate, we of course try, right, for our patients who are uh, stage four and need that kind of help. <clears throat> okay, melanoma. So, in Arizona, we are clearly, clearly aware as nurses that melanoma is a problem, right? It's a cancerous neoplasm that is present in the epidermis and dermis layer. It manifests as a change in the uh, nevus or new growth on the skin. Typically the color is dark or red or maybe blue colored or maybe a mix of those colors. Um, typically irregular shape. Um, they itch many times. They have, they're very rapid growing. Uh, they may have an ulceration, they may bleed. Um, and then we know that treatment is to cut it out, right? Surgical excision is the treatment, remove the melanoma because the longer it's in the body, the more deadly it gets and it spreads to the lymph nodes and then it's systemic, right? And then possibly chemo and or radiation after the melanoma um, is cut out, okay? I think it's critically important that we educate our patients to make sure that they're going annually to a uh, specialized uh, doctor who, for the skin, right, who looks specifically head to toe with the patient naked in between the toes everywhere for any kind of potential melanoma, right? I had a student recently within the last year go through my class um, who got uh, diagnosed with melanoma and he's going through radiation and chemo treatment as we speak. It was between his toes and um, they just happened to look there and found it, right? But the previous doctors hadn't ever looked there. So make sure <clears throat> when you tell your patients they go for their, you know, yearly evaluation to have, make sure the doctors look, you know, between their toes too. Um, some reconstructive procedures that need to be done for patients because the amount of tissue lost is so great would be a skin graft, right? So we have um, autografts or autologous grafts, which refers to the, the term that uh, the transplant is comprises the individual's own organ, own tissue, or their own cells, right? So we transfer that patient's own skin from one part of the body to another. Um, an allograft uh, is a tissue that is transplanted from one person to another. So we have autografts, 
or autologous grafts, that's the person gives their self a skin transplant, all allograft, A-L-L-O graft is when one person gives skin to another person or a transplant from another person, right? And then we have xenografts, which um, transplantation of cells or tissues between different species, which is unique. And we do those kinds of graphs as well. So let me see. Um, when, when I was doing preclinical research, it is important to mention that xenografts are commonly used to test the efficacy of new cancer treatments, which was kind of cool, right? Um, and then we have next is split thickness. Um, a split thickness graft uh, by definition refers to a graft that contains the epidermis and the portion of the dermis, which in contrast to a full thickness skin graft, which uh, would consist of the entire epidermis and dermis. Okay, so again, partial or split, sorry, not partial, split thickness is where you have um, the epidermis and a portion of the dermis and then full thickness is you know, the entire dermis and epidermis. Then we have muscle flaps. So muscle flaps uses only muscle for uh, defect coverage. It is primarily to provide a well vascularized soft tissue that is relatively resistant to infection. It helps heal wounds. Um, it offers a vascularized surface for skin grafts, right? So it's really great. Um, and a muscle flap is commonly used to eradicate infection and to also revitalize uh, bone, believe it or not. We use them a lot. Uh, the care of the patient with skin diagnoses, impaired skin integrity, that's a good one. Disturbed body image, could be, or deficient knowledge, for sure. Interventions for stomata, uh, stomatitis, sorry, and, or mucositis. So you do need to know about stomatitis and mucositis, okay? All right, so stomatitis refers to inflammation of the oral mucosa, which presents with ulcers that can cause pain, significant pain, and difficulty drinking and eating, right? Ulcers can be present on the inner lips, in the cheeks, in the gums, on the tongue, basically anywhere, um, and are caused by infections or irritants or maybe trauma. Maybe it was simply somebody, um, you know, running into a wall or whatever, or maybe even allergic reactions. I've seen patients get them before with allergic reactions that break down the skin inside the mouth, right? Interventions include meticulous oral hygiene, avoiding any type of commercial mouthwashes, uh, absolutely no alcohol-based mouthwashes. They need to keep their lips moist with lip balm, petroleum, or linolen, something, right? We recommend cool mist, humidified air, um, wet dressings or wet baths for the wounds, uh, hygiene measures, all kinds of that, uh, keeping you know great hygiene measures. We want to rinse with salt water. Um, sometimes the doctors will order like a lidocaine uh, swish and spit uh, or even swish and swallow mm, just to numb that area because it can be very painful. I think it's important that that patients practice proper dental care clearly. Um, sometimes the doctors will give a great topical anesthetic again, and I did mention the lidocaine, but there's like xylocaine, um, uh, you know, that they can apply, apply to the ulcer itself, right? It's like a topical xylocaine that they uh, put up literally against the ulcer, and it totally makes it feel so much better. Now, kids under six can't use that, the xylocaine. Um, and then again, we might use a topical corticosteroid, such as trimethylone. Uh, there's like a trimethylone uh, dental paste. Uh, you don't need to know that med, but... Um, it protects the sores inside the lip and on the gums. And uh, so it, you know, it allows it to heal basically. Have a bigger understanding, like it allows it to heal, right? Putting something on there that allow. One that will provide relief, pain relief, that was the xylocaine. And then two, the, the paste that actually allows the skin to heal. 
All right. Wow. I think we covered it all. That was a long chapter, uh, but this is the end of this one. Thank you.